Hey guys, welcome to Real Perspectives. I am Latanya Moore. We have a absolutely fabulous, fabulous show for you guys tonight. Mario and I are going to be talking about how to spot a hobosexual. Now, I have to give you guys a little bit of some background because it wasn't until recently that I realized that this entire phenomenon actually had some type of name, right? I mean, people call it a bunch of different things, but I had never heard of the term hobosexual. So I saw this on social media and I put it in some groups that I'm in and people started educating me about it. And I said, okay, we gotta do a show about this because there, there are so many things related to hobosexual outside of the relationship dynamic. So before we get to those though, I just, I just, I gotta let Mario, look, y'all know Mario is our research king, right? He is the man with the plan and the man with the facts. So Mario, I'm gonna pitch it to you to talk a little bit more about hobosexual and some statistics that we found, because this is going to, this gonna bless some people. I believe that, uh, fam. We're glad to be back here again, and I'm telling you, get ready for a real serious ride, all right? So we saw these articles that were talking about it, because when, when LaTanya told me about it, I said, well, I don't even know what that is either, you know? And I kept thinking that she was saying homosexual. She said, no, Mario, hobosexual. I said, what is that? She sent me this article. I want to read this to you. The term homosexual was coined by writer Nikita Nietzsche. And she describes a homosexual as a person who dates you with a sole interest of having a place to stay, not a genuine romantic interest. These people are serial daters and they jump from home to home just as quickly as they jump from relationship to relationship. This person will eat all your food, borrow your money, have you always foot the bill, be emotionally manipulative, all while hanging out on your oh so comfy couch. Now see, I already know that some of you all have been involved with some hobosexuals. This is so common, <laughs> you know? What you what, what are you thinking, Tanya? I mean, really, for real, like, wow. You know, let me say this first, let me say this. Do you know that normally the family and the friends recognize him before the person who's actually being victimized realizes it? That's crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you know, I mean, realistically, it's like that with all of our relationship red flags. You know, we always talk about, you know, we've done several shows like this, right? That are relationship red flags and things that people need to know and understand while they are working through their relationship issues. But here's my perspective on the hobosexual. I think that the, the, the biggest negative to the hobosexual is the fact that there, there's not a genuine interest. So mm -hmm. that, that level of dis, dishonesty really, I believe, is where the betrayal comes in. So you know your girl, your sister, your mama, they're like, oh, you know, that dude just using you, honey, because he wants a place to stay, or he just needs something to eat, or Lord, where did you find him? <laughs> All of those things tend to be indications that that's what they believe. And so when you think about that, I believe that a lot of this comes down to betrayal. But here's the thing, some people don't see it like that. I mean, they like, look, you gotta deal with, what is it, uh, the hierarchy of need, right? Yeah. Food, shelter, water, like those, that's, that's the, the, the basic human need. And so some people say, look, these guys are just fulfilling their basic human need. And so as a, as a woman, for example, if, if the woman is the person being victimized, then that person needs to be up on their game and they need to put their foot down and say, this is what it's gonna be. You're gonna be living here and this is what you're gonna have to do. And watch this, this is so funny too, because this is the second part of it. It says, if and when you get frustrated with the emotional and financial abuse, this person finds themselves a similar setup with a new partner, because they're serial, they're serial. So they can always find someone who's open for that. And so I thought about it after we, you know, just kind of thinking about what we we're going to talk about today. I thought about the fact that um, some people weigh stuff out in the balance. 
Because you think about it now, is that they're there, you get companionship for the lonely person. Um, they get sex, perhaps, you know what I'm saying? Because he's going to sex them down to keep that, that flow going. Um, and so what they do is they weigh out the good and the bad. So if I'm getting my sexual needs fulfilled, my companionship needs fulfilled, then maybe that's the cost of it. Maybe that's the cost of it. I have literally talked to people for many, many, many years that felt like, yo, you know what? It's a win-win because I get the companionship that I desire. I get some sex and, you know, he gets some food. He's there when I get home. He ain't got no car, so he's going to be at home. You know what I mean? So when I get there, or he takes me to work, keeps the car, comes back and pick me up, but I do know he's coming back, so I get what I want out of the deal too. That's hard for some people to understand, but that's the arrangement. And you know, we've talked about several relationship types that are financially centered, including marriages, you know? So yeah. hey. Yeah, absolutely. The, the thing that I think that makes the hobo sexual setup different from what you describe. See, what you describe is a mutual understanding, okay? This isn't someone that believes that there's a future with this person or that this person really cares about them. My thought process as I read about the psychology of the hobosexual is that there's a ruse involved. Mm -hmm. There, it, It's not that situation where it's like, look, I ain't got no job or no money. And the person says, hey, I got a job, I got a money, I got money, I got the house uh i just need you for sex or whatever those things are so if they're saying hey i just need you for sex and you guys have this great relationship you know you have agreed to those terms i don't necessarily think i guess technically that would not be a hobosexual relationship because the whole psychology and methodology with the hobosexual is really about the rules oh i love you i want to be with you we're going to be together forever and so therefore because we gonna be together forever let's just do this when the whole time their real motives is just to again meet the meet the minimum need food shelter water we can't hear we can't hear you mario oh i'm sorry you know? there we go I, I'm sorry. See, I wonder, though, sometimes on the flip of that, I wonder, do people recognize it, though? Are they deceived at that point? Because like, like right now, when we think about it, like, who doesn't realize by now that that's not a that's not a setup? But this dude is like only coming around. He's not working. He's only staying here on you. Like, and you know that that's the only reason why, because he didn't get nowhere else to go. Like, to, for me, this is just my thought, though. Like, at what point did you not see this? Like, how much deception is really involved in a person who does not have their own place or at least living with somebody, and he only comes to you, he has no contribution, you know, and let's just put this here too. It's not just men on women, though. You know, it's not that, because uh, there's another article that talks about men being the recipients of the same thing. You know, but the problem with that is, and we'll get into it a little bit later, is that it's almost customary. We talked a little about a little bit about uh, customs last week. That it's almost looked at as that's what a dude is supposed to do. You know, you're supposed to take care of somebody. You know, help them get on their feet because that's what you do. That's that's a man thing. But then back to the the the, the reverse side of it, I just wonder, Tanya, like, at what point did you not see? that even your mom and them told you early on growing up, you don't let no man lay up on you. You know, you, you don't need a man that can't do nothing for you. But then you let this dude come. And I think that that's where the conversation needs to turn with a lot of people. Like, before we say she's victimized, let's ask her, did she know this? Didn't she see this? And what she thought the benefit was. Yeah, absolutely. I think to kind of speak to what you're saying about did the person's mother teach them this or grandma, you know, whoever that influential woman was in their life. Part of the problem is that sometimes they see this example, right? If you're telling your, your son or daughter, don't let someone do this, then they see that that's what you're doing. They see that that's your lifestyle. You can say that all day long, but this is what they know because that is their normal. And part of the problem when you start creating 
normal, you know, normal uh, social norms within your own demographic, this is the stuff that you see. If you see that mama going to work every day and her man laid up on the couch, she may tell you, baby, don't you let no man lay up on you. Now that's true. But that's all true. you know is that this is what men do. So you don't have a reference point when it comes to the other thing. Right. I would also venture to guess that then if you did see the other thing, guess what? You're going to turn it down. You're going to think something wrong with him because this is not what men do. Why are you offering me money? I ain't going to sleep with you, you know, right. now or, or I don't need you to pay my bills. Right. So That's the thing true. is, those very things that your mama told you don't don't let a man do. You invite those things because you don't want a man who's going to do those other things. So I think all of those things play into the situation of this homosexual. But, you know, you mentioned something because I've talked to, of course, my son, who's a millennial, about this whole concept. And he does not believe Now, this is a millennial talking. Mm -hmm. He does not believe that a woman can be a homosexual. A millennial does not believe wow. that a woman really can be a homosexual. And that's it's because true. of the things that you mentioned. Well, I mean, but that's what that's what men do. Like that's what mm -hmm. they're they're supposed they're supposed to take care of things. You know, they're not supposed to live off of a woman. And so you can't really apply that same term to a woman, but my conversation with him was, well, I feel like it's a double standard then because like you mentioned, there are women that do the exact same thing. I'm with this guy because I need a place to stay. Mm -hmm. I need that. Yeah, I give him sex every now and then. That's my contribution. But I but I have my, again, those three basic needs. I right. have those three basic needs met. So I would like to hear from you, though, Mario. What do you think about that? When you hear someone, whether it's a millennial or someone else, who says that a woman really can't be a homosexual. What do you think about that? I would say that that has a lot to do with the environment a millennial has been raised in. Um, I think that's a value system your son is speaking from. Um, not saying it's not in, that it's not valid, but I'm saying that's, a, that's almost uh, how he was raised. He's speaking from an environmental situation and those values that have been put in him. Um, I think that when we use the term gold digger, it's the same thing. You see what I mean? It's just a different term that you're just looking. You know that you have no romantic interest in this dude, but he does have some money. And you'll do whatever you have to do to make sure that you get, even if you're not living with him, you get your rent paid, your hair done, your nails done, and so on and so forth. Um, it's an age old thing. But if we put different terms to it, we've been talking about the same thing. And you think about it now, the mother would also say to a man, you also now, because times have changed, since y'all want equality, guess what, son? She need to have a job too, because you all need two incomes so you can get some things done. And if she won't work, you don't need it. She's sorry, she's lazy, she won't clean up, she don't love you. Because she would, if she did, she'd go out there and help you all get something. That's almost a value thing to me. And so I understand where your son is coming from because that's what I was raised believing, hearing, being taught until I saw it differently. When I saw, as you talked about, the ruse, the deception of, of it happening, then I recognized that the female has gotten the past because culturally we've been taught that's what you're supposed to do is take care of her. But see, now when we think about how deliberate the female is about that, and you have the men who are just as deliberate, you see, that's where I get with you on, let's not have a double standard. Let's not have a double standard. Oh, because you got, yeah, you, have, you, know, you got women now who are earning way more than men anyway. You know, and so, yeah, I, I get what your son is saying, though. I really do. But I also think that women have been doing it for quite some time. It's age old. See, I, I get it. Like, I, I, I agree with you to a certain extent. And let okay. me tell you why. Okay. Because I still believe that there's a different psychology when it comes to the, to the homosexual, even as it relates to a gold digger relationship. Because typically, with a gold digger relationship, it is abundantly clear that we in this, and this is what you're going to do. Right? Like it, it is like it, it, it is a clear that my expectation is that 
these are all the financial things that you're going to do for me. Oh, you that's that lawyer talking to you. No, 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 no. Wait, let me, let me, no, man. Ah, I'll turn more. Because see, let me tell you why. I ain't trying to interrupt you. Let me tell you why that's that lawyer talking to you. You all about the contract. As long as we are clear on the terms, we understand what's going on, then it cannot be that. Uh, but see, that's that lawyer. And I agree with you. That, that is true. I'm not going to say that you're wrong now. But I'm saying you're speaking from that lawyer because here's some dudes that believe the stripper love him. She, he goes in there and believes that that stripper loves him and that she's been waiting for him every night to come in there with that money and that nobody else gets the same thing he gets. Well, that, that's true. But again, I think when you, or a, a, again, not to sound lawyer-like, <laughs> but realistically, the, the issue is always this person is using me for a place to stay. And when that is over, when 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 I you know when I rise up or whatever the 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 term is or the situation that happens now he's gone he's bounced to the next person. What I'm saying in a typical gold digger relationship, it's clear, right? Mm -hmm. It's clear that I want you I want your money, and if that's not if you can't do that for me, I can't be with you. Gotcha. Right. Got you. And and so there uh, again, but I'm just a firm believer that you got to put cards on the table. What do you want and what are your expectations and whatever you want, whatever your expectations are, you need to put that out up front. And then it's up to the other person whether or not they're going to agree to that. Because once you agree to this relationship, you must be on mute. Can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Oh, yep, I can hear you now. So you you must agree when once you agree to the terms. I know that's that's very lawyer like, and maybe no. But you've been consistent about that though. That's yeah, the one. I mean, I'm like that no matter what we talk about. Absolutely, you you are consistent about that on every level. So you have not deviated. That it the terms need to be clear. I, I agree with you on that, and it does save a lot of time. When you date a person and they start telling you, and and this happens, they talk about their previous relationships. Mm -hmm. You knew that he was just living with Tasha and now he living with you or before Tasha, he was living with Beverly and before Beverly, he was living with Sheila and he moved yeah. out of all of those ladies' houses and now y'all talking about moving in together because he didn't gave you this side story about how, yeah, you know, I was there and, you know, I was paying bills and she did this and I'm in between places. See, my question going to be where your mom at? <laughs> I just want to know like, oh, or, or I'm going to say, oh, wow, like, what are you going to do? Yeah, yeah. See, because once, put it on them. And if they start saying how, well, you know, can I crash on your couch? You can say no. One thing about no is that no is an absolute. Right? Ain't nothing else after no. There's nothing else to do. But when you say yes, that comes to the obligations later down the road. If I think about it, can I stay with you? No. That's it. In finite, bam, you're done. But if I say yes, now we got to talk about well, when you moving in, how long you need to see. Now you got some more stuff to talk about. That's true. That's true. So it's a difference between I'm sleeping in my car tonight. Can I crash on your car to on your house um, on your couch tonight? Then I have nowhere to go. Can I move in? Absolutely. That need to be a no. If you know you on you you ain't ready for a hobosexual setup because you don't know what the situation is. So if this person doesn't have a job and all of those things, you have to be prepared to continue this for a while. One other thing I really want, and, and I know I, I talk about a lot of legal stuff, but y'all just need to know this. When you let someone move into your home, whether it's a place that you're renting, whether, well, let's, let's start here. You own a home and you allow someone to move in. So you're in this homosexual relationship, situationship, whatever you call it. Once you let them live there for a certain amount of time, and it's different in different states, don't you let them get any mail at your house. Oh, Lord. Because then that creates a legal obligation and a residence for them. And guess what? Now you got to evict them if they push it. And the homosexual knows this. And a homosexual knows this. So <laughs> right. you have to think about all of those things, which means that yeah. if you're forced to have to evict them, you got to wait for the eviction process. A lot of states will not let you do what's called self-help, meaning lock the door, change the locks, 
throw their stuff outside. Like they won't let you do that. That's right. Right. And so you got to think about this. It doesn't matter if it's a homosexual or, or your, your cousin, right? These are all the same. So you got to think about there's everything we talk about. Yes, there's a relationship implication, but there's also a legal implication to this. You need to think about right. that before you go and start doing that. Let me read this. This is very interesting right here. Um, the LA Times released a podcast called Dirty John, which follows the story of Deborah Newell, a successful interior designer who calls for John Meehan, the ultimate homosexual, a handsome man who seems to check all the boxes, attentive, available, and successful, only to have him slither his way into a hardened home with deadly results. I remember watching Dirty John's show. That, that, that series was so good. And it was real. And she was super, super successful. Um, and it was, it's a true story, too. She was super successful. And he charmed his way into her heart, got all her money, started taking control of the house and everything. Now, it goes on to say, now, if you're starting to feel uneasy and that some of the above mentioned information is hitting close to home, here are seven signs that your bae is actually a hobosexual using you for living space. Are we ready, Tanya? Ready? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. See, okay. Because that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking you know, about. And, and that's what I'm saying, and I think that when we look at this hobosexual relationship, now, of course, you and I both got a very hearty laugh out of this whole term and yeah. terminology, but from a relationship standpoint, it can be devastating for the person that feels victimized. Absolutely. It, it, it really can. And I know it can that cost you financially and ruin you. Absolutely. Because yeah. you're bringing this person in. They're in your home. They have access to your personal papers while you at work. <laughs> right? Or they're in your car. <laughs> right. While you at work. You know, you got to think about that. You're getting, you're getting mail there. That could be information about credit card statements. Or they're up at night, raff, raff, you know, rifling through or rambling through your purse and your social security card is in there. Like, you got to really think about this stuff. Absolutely. Right? You have to really, really think about this stuff. Or they taking pictures of your of your debit card and they charging stuff online while you gone, mm -hmm. but the debit card in your purse. Like, there are lots of, and, and again, we're talking about the horror stories because that's what matters. The Absolutely. Yacht doesn't matter. It's good. You, this is the agreement that you have, but you also need to think about the precaution. But Mario, in the time that we have left, I, I got to I gotta pitch it to you because I know that you counsel a lot of people with this stuff, but I want you to talk a little bit about the psychology from the victim standpoint. Like, what do you see most often as the type of people that end up on the bad end, you know, in terms of having somebody come and freeload off of them, uh, what, what type of person do you normally see that this happens to? Well, it's the person who has normally a very good heart. They're generous in nature. Um, they are looking for love. They desire love. They desire companionship. And somehow or another, they feel that they have to accommodate a person, no matter how they are, just to get that companionship. They, they're normally been, the, 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 the female is normally a per person who has been hurt several times, um, suffers from the wounds of rejection. And so they've gotten to a place where they feel like this is what I got to do to have the companionship. Now, this is one of the things in the article that I want to say, and then I'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, one of the signs that you may be headed that way is your relationship moves at a warp speed. You've gone out for coffee twice and maybe dinner once, but this person is already pushing for more. Maybe they want to spend the night, become official right away, and get serious way before you both have gotten a chance to really get to know each other. Uh, it could be magic fit, a magic fit or something else. So stopping to take a minute and figure out shouldn't bother you or your new boo. Now, that's the thing that I see is that desperation. This person that I've seen before and I talk to a lot uh, or the people that I talk to are normally so desperate for a relationship and they normally all have the same common thread, a lot of rejection. 
a lot of rejection. So when they start moving, that guy starts moving really, really, really fast, then she's like, oh, wow, it takes her by storm because there's some vulnerability. The rejection has created a greater level of vulnerability. And so she's a little open. She's a little receptive, even though something tells her, yo, slow down, slow down, slow down. It's too much. But remember now, the homosexual is charming as all get out. His charisma and his game is on point, you see. And so I see that person that has had a series of rejection. They now are second guessing themselves. They're wondering if something is wrong with them. They're looking at everyone else, even those females that, that they are friends with that may be doing the same thing. You talked about earlier uh, seeing that lifestyle and seeing it made normal. And so maybe their friends are kind of doing that and it's working for them or at least the appearance of it. So now they say, I'll try it. I'll give it a try. And I'm gonna tell you what I've noticed on you. There's more than anything. It, start, it takes only one time to do it. And they seem addicted to it after that. Even though they've experienced it the first time, they were left devastated, financially devastated, they are still open to have it again. And I wonder often, how does that happen? Like, you know now what you're looking at. I'm thinking, you have a record now. You have, you've seen the system. You've been victimized, you know it. But I promise you, I see them become the serial dater for the homosexual. And that's so devastating to me. So I spent a lot of time trying to now reprogram them a little bit in their thinking to be able to recognize it on the front end and, and kind of get them to, to recognize this is not the way you should be living because you don't even have no more money left for the homosexual. You need to be one now. You know what I mean? Because you broke. You, yes, you about right. to become that's a homosexual. Gone. They're gone yeah. because the, the, the things that they enjoy about it, whether, uh, again, because if the if the money is gone, that food, water, shelter is gone. Those Absolutely. things are in jeopardy. So they got to yeah. figure out, OK, what's the next step? Or they know, look, the gig is up. You know, she on to me. So I'm going to yeah. have to start. So then they, they they on Facebook in somebody's DM or they on Instagram, right. you know, trying to trying to ease up the other person. So well, one uh, more thing. I, oh, go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry. One more thing that I wanted that I definitely in the, in the time we have, I wanted to say this, too. One of the things they point out in here is that um, they have a key, a drawer, and start leaving personal items around your home. Uh, but you've never invited them to live with you. Do you know, Tanya, that one of the things that I've seen happen is that there was never an agreement. You talked about it a few minutes ago about let's talk about it. When you say if they ask, say no. But if you say yes, we have to now start negotiating terms. All right? But here's the thing. Most of the people that I have ever uh, dealt with in, in a coaching session or on this wise, even in the pastorate, there was never an agreement. They just somehow ended there. Let me tell you what the old people used to say. All right, if somebody come and y'all y'all over there sleeping together and they spend the night, don't let them leave no shoes under your bed. Why? Because that means they're going to be moving in. Do you know that's true? I don't know what kind. It may seem like a little myth or whatever, but if they leave some food, some shoes underneath the bed, they, them old people say they're going to be moving in. But what happened, it's amazing that there was never a solid conversation. It just somehow evolved into them being there. And before you know it, you're giving them a key. They got some drawers. Now you're moving some space in the closet. And nobody ever talked about it. Nobody ever talked yeah. about it. So when, they st when you start having financial problems, because now everything has increased because there's another body there, and you start getting a little budget in place, and they can't get everything that they used to have, like you said, they will move out. They're going to move on. And normally they are already working on that and keep a reservoir of people that are waiting for them to come over there and do that. Awesome. So you guys heard it. Listen, he's the master at this. And I just want to let you guys know that this is really a, in, in my opinion, this is a dangerous phenomenon, right? Because you're, you're really talking about people that their whole objective is to infiltrate, but really just to get their needs met. So I would say anybody in this situation that doesn't want to be, because I have to put that out there. Some people want to be, and that's fine. But if you're in this situation and doesn't, and you don't want to be, and you don't have 
a, a exit plan. You don't know what to do. You know, certainly feel free to reach out. You guys can contact us. Make sure that you go to the Real Perspectives TV show Facebook page, like the page. You can always inbox me. You can always inbox uh, Mario or reach out to us for some information um, on how to help you in this situation. And so again, thank you guys so much for being here and being a part of Real Perspectives. And to next time, have a great day.